It is time for Around the 412 with Smitty and Tyler. Welcome back to another episode of Around the 412. I am Tyler. With me, as always, is my co-host, Smitty. Go follow us on all of our social medias at Around the 412, whether that's on X, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. We're everywhere, so go give us a a shout on there. Also, go check us out on YouTube. If you're not watching on YouTube already, go over to YouTube. Give us a like on the channel. Hit subscribe and leave a comment. Let us know any questions you want to see in future videos. Let us know what you like on the channel, what you dislike. Anything that you want, let us know and go subscribe to us over on YouTube. Uh, This is a Steelers show, and I got to say, big surprise from our Steelers show last week with the reception it got a pleasant surprise I will say over five, five last I checked it was 5.2 thousand views um, which was awesome but you know what's not awesome is like 92 percent of you were not subscribed to the channel so what are you doing it's free it is free to subscribe subscribe to the channel hit the bell so you're notified anytime we post a video and you know, it's, it, we just got to pump up those numbers. That's, that's as simple as that. That's crazy. I'm used to like 60%. I think it's like the number that it typically is uh, for people that watch and aren't subscribed. That is an astronomical number though. So yes, please subscribe, like the video, leave us a comment. Let us know what you would like to see in the future. Hopefully a lot of those people uh, from last week come back and watch this episode. Big shout out uh, to our boy DB and Patrick Queen because I think they had a lot to do with that. So let's give them a shout out on here as well steelers db if you miss his exclusive interview with patrick queen be sure to check that out great conversation with those two new steelers linebacker uh we will give a shout out unlike mike florio of uh pro football talk to Derek bell for doing that exclusive interview with patrick queen so go check that out if you haven't yet but i assume most of you at this time probably have um all right so yeah let's talk some Steelers shall we uh OTAs we are in second week of them and I feel like as they go on the less there becomes to talk about like early on in the process it's fun because like oh this guy's playing this position oh this guy looks like he's put on some weight uh you know we talked about the physical maturation and how serious they took the offseason for George Pickens and Joey Porter looking like they added some mass uh Troy Fatanu getting first team reps on the right side like those are things that are notable as we get into this week it's kind of like eh, you know what are we really going to talk about um so I'm glad that we were able to get some questions but there is something of note here Alan Saunders Steelers now my guy that I do Steelers afternoon drive with got an exclusive this week James Daniels like unprompted just came out and told him that the Steelers are not negotiating an extension with him at this time and they're not going to this offseason so that means he's going to hit unrestricted free agency after 2024 they're going to let this season play out and see where they're at um i want to get your thoughts on this because to me uh i I don't get it like i'll be honest like i I, don't get me wrong i fully trust what omar khan has done here in his tenure with the steelers but this was one of those things i'll say similarly to kind of like the entire way that they've gone about the wide receiver position this offseason where i just can't align myself with whatever the thought is like i just i can't get on board with trying to figure out this process uh james daniels in my opinion a very good player uh was their most steady consistent offensive lineman last year isaac sam all was a very good player as well but i thought that he kind of had trouble getting acclimated early on daniels was a steady presence start to finish last year and here's the thing still only 27 years old like he's he's in Mm -hmm. line to get another bag and maybe that's part of this um you know as they saw the guard market just blow up Robert Hunt getting hundred million dollars from Carolina. Kevin Dotson obviously got paid. Jonah Jackson got paid. Like a lot of guards got paid last off season. And I wonder if the Steelers just realized we're not going to be in that market, you know? So we're not going to like, you know, waste James Daniels time if we're not even going to come close to those numbers. So play out this year and see where we're at following 2024. Um, but to not even have a conversation to me is, is the weird part here, because like I said, good player, still just 27 and where their priorities have been with building up this offensive line. It just kind of seems odd to me that they're not even having a conversation with the guy. Yeah. I think that's interesting. Um, it's not like it's a position like tackle where you just drafted your replacement. And if you were guy, a guy like Dan Moore jr. And this is happening to hmm. you, like, I feel like that would be totally different if, if that was the conversation, but James Daniels is 
an incumbent starter on this team. And when you look at the guard depth, I mean, they, they must feel a lot more confident in like a guy, a guy like Spencer Anderson and how they feel about him moving forward than I do as far as the future of the guard position. Because like after James Daniels, you're looking at a combination of what Nate Herbig, uh, Spencer Anderson, and Mason McCormick to try to make up some of those spots. I don't think that that is necessarily a confidence booster moving forward. Now, listen, maybe McCormick is going to to hit in stride, and maybe by year two he is that starting spot, and that's totally fine and dandy, and it, it makes the Steelers look like geniuses. But I feel, feel like it is interesting that they're not even having that conversation to at least entertain the idea because you can have a conversation – and still not come to an agreement and still ultimately not extend a contract right. offer. But you can have those negotiations. To the fact that the Steelers are having no negotiation whatsoever with James Daniels, that's very interesting to me considering how good he's been at the position and considering what they have, I guess, behind him at the position because going into next season, if that is the case, then guard becomes a very important position to watch uh, off, long, along that offensive line. It, it mm-hmm. goes to the – tackle territory of what it's been the last couple of years because you got Isaac Samalu who while he's been great and with his first season and hopefully continue to that he's not getting any younger and then you have a bunch of younger guys that are more so inexperienced with uh Herbix uh, Sander or Anderson and McCormick who is going to be a rookie that don't have that much experience at the NFL level and so you're not going to have a for sure guy like you do with James Daniels I'm not saying they, they need to sign him but it is interesting to me from the Steelers approach like why would you not even see what you can even work out with him like sure Daniels might get up to like 15 million dollars a year by someone in free agency because someone is going to be willing to pay him probably a hefty contract for how good he's been but that doesn't mean that you have to be that team just because you entertain the idea of a contract extension doesn't mean that you're going to have to be the one to give it to him. I, do, I just don't understand that from Omar Khan and the Steelers, especially at a team that doesn't have for sure depth behind it. Right now, like three years, $26.5 million, I think was what it, the contract he originally signed. So less than $9 million per. I mean, he's, pr- he's going to double that, if not come very close mm-hmm. uh, to doubling that. So... I mean, yeah, I can understand if, you know, you go through negotiations and you're just so far apart, but that's the thing. They're not even having a conversation right now about it. And maybe this is kind of just going to be a theme, maybe because of the way that they went about the Najee Harris business, maybe with the way they're going about James Daniels. We'll see about Pat Fryermuth. Maybe it's going down this same road too. Maybe it really is just wanting to see everybody play within this offense before making any decisions about who they're attaching future to. Uh, beyond 2024. Yeah, that's that's true. This could be c- becoming a pattern, and maybe we're just so used to the way that like Kevin Colbert operated. We haven't seen a ton of uh, experience with Omar Khan. We've only had one season with him, at, at least complete season with him as GM, and we haven't really mm-hmm. seen this a ton in the past when it comes to like Kevin Colbert being the GM. I feel like at least negotiations would have been had by now. Now, maybe this regime is going to be different and Omar Khan operates differently. And everything that we've seen from Omar Khan up to this point has led me to believe that he is going to do the right thing for this organization. But it's still, it, it is very interesting to me that you don't even have some of these conversations. That, that's, that's what I'm curious about. And maybe those conversations do come. Like as of right now, James Daniels doesn't have a conversation. Maybe later this summer they do. But I. <laughs> It's interesting. I mean, he made and it seem like he was told different. they're not going to do it. Like, yeah, that's true. That's he true. Basically, the way that he told Allen was the Steelers told him he, he's not. They're not having those negotiations this year before the season. So, and they don't negotiate in season. Now, would that be broken? Like, because we're talking about this front office operating differently, could they also break their own trend in that way, where they are willing to extend in season? And they'll I also think have they a should. period. Of time. I always thought that was a dumb. I thought that was a dumb tradition that that Colbert and the Steelers have done yeah. in years past. They'll also have a period of time, obviously, whether they make the playoffs or not, you have a period of time before, you know, unrestricted free agency hits where they'll be able to talk mm-hmm. to their own guys exclusively. So I don't know, maybe that's when it gets revisited. I just, I don't understand this process. Don't think I'll ever be able to wrap my mind around the idea of not even having a conversation with a guy, 
but it's it's the way that this is going. So, you know, I, maybe yeah. it makes it more realistic that we do see. Like, on the other hand, I just mentioned um, about maybe they're just not looking to extend anybody in the offense because they want to see them all in a new system. Maybe the other way of looking at it is maybe it makes a Pat Frymuth extension more likely. Like, that's what they plan to do with the dollars right now is look at a Pat Frymuth extension as opposed to a James Daniels one, try to get him at a lower number than you feel like he's going to be after having a 2024 in Arthur Smith's offense with an expanded role that we've talked about. Like, I don't want to use the term buy low, but like almost right. Like you're, you're kind of mm-hmm. paying for what you think he's going to be, the not potential. necessarily what he has been. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I could see that. And I feel like some of these positions are, like when you look at like running back, for example, Najee, you have a a guy behind them that, that could step in as your future starter if need be. Now, whether or not you could say the same thing about the card position, I think there are guys that probably, even if the fan base doesn't like it, the Steelers probably feel better than the fan base does about someone like Spencer Anderson or their rookie uh, McCormick. I, I, I feel like they probably have a higher hope for those guys. And, and I mean, to be honest, they, they're going to know them better than we will. So maybe they see the writing on the wall that, hey, we don't have to pay this guy because we have these guys behind him that could fill in that spot. And so maybe that's just the way that they're going to be looking at these positions. And it se- seems different to me than any other like Steelers uh, like off seasons or contract talks that we've ever had, really just talking about like the Kevin Colbert era as, as the Steelers GM, because we're talking about it seems more just like strictly business with Omar Khan. It doesn't seem like there's no sentimental feel when it comes to these negotiations. It's what is going to make this team the best team they can be in a given season. And if it's not going to be keeping this player around or that player around, then they're going to cut ties. I mean, even and whether you you agree with him or not or believe him or not, uh, Allen Robinson saying that he didn't know that he was going to be cut by the Steelers or didn't didn't wasn't aware that that was uh, something that was going to happen. I mean, first off, how could you not, Allen? I'm sorry, but <laughs> but right. but at the same time, it's just like if the Steelers don't think that you're helping this team, it feels like I feel like they are more so than ever just willing to cut ties with a player. I mean, look look at look at if Kevin Colbert was the GM, Kenny Pickett would not be a Philadelphia Eagle, and I'm pretty confident of that. I agree. Yeah. Because I don't even think they go about the quarterback position the same way. Like that's what you're saying is they probably don't yeah. pursue Russell Wilson. And I don't think, I don't think they, they operate started that chain reaction the yeah. same way. Yeah. I'm in agreement there. Uh, but Omar Khan is just, whether you agree with the moves or disagree with the moves, certainly been more aggressive. And as a Steelers fan, it's just like totally different from what we're used to. It's been a complete game changer. What's going on, everybody? Smitty from around the 412, and I just want to take a quick second to give a shout out to our folks at Game Changers. Their logo on the screen right now, right above my microphone. Uh, over 2,000 different designs in their catalog. Luxury heavyweight material. I am wearing one of their shirts right now. Best vintage t-shirts in the game. Head over to GameChanger.LA or Pick6.LA to pick up some shirts, and guess what? Use code AT412. Save yourself $10 on your order Every single time again, game changer.la or pick six.la best vintage t shirts in the game. Check them out. Guy looks familiar, less facial hair, a little bit, but looks familiar. Very uh, younger Arthur Smith, <laughs> a younger Arthur Smith telling you about game changer. I'm actually, and it's funny because like in that Probably promo, I'm obviously wearing a shirt because of doing that, but I'm wearing one right now as well. Pat McAfee, game changer shirt. Um, but I wanted to kind of parlay off that conversation because Najee Harris falls into that bucket that we were just talking about um, and talk about the running back usage in this offense. Jalen Warren, very fired up about the way running backs have been used early on uh, and thinks they're going to continue to be used, both him and Najee Harris. And I think you're going to see both on the field quite a bit together. I know we've talked about this idea in the past and it's been like, okay, we're going to see it come to fruition uh, in the regular season. But you look at the roster and I know that like we're getting sick and tired of talking about the receivers, right? But like Jalen Warren and Najee Harris are like easily two of your four best eligibles right now. Like mm-hmm. George Pickens, Pat Fryermuth, Najee Harris, Jalen Warren, Roman Wilson, right? Like that's your top five eligibles. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I think you're going to see both on the field quite a bit. Like, and they've talked about being lined up out wide and not like the type that we saw last year where we would see guys start out. We would see Najee or Jalen start out out wide and then they'd motion them in. And then it'd be like, you know, running from a shotgun. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm literally talking about running routes, doing things on the outside, playing on the perimeter. Because let's be honest, Najee was, how many passes did he catch the rookie? Somewhere between 60, 70 ish, right? And then, like, hasn't been anywhere close to that. And I know that, like, Jalen is the more talented pass catcher here. But I think that there's still some untapped stuff there with Najee Harris that this team just hasn't been doing since his rookie year that you can use him in a variety of ways. And I mean, I've seen the videos, I've heard, you know, people say things and it's kind of that time of year where this is always talked about, but he looks good. Like he looks like he's definitely trimmed down a bit. I think he's motivated because of his contract situation, getting to hit free agency after this year. There's just so many factors here that get me really excited about not either one of these guys, but like them together, Najee Harris and Jalen Warren, I think are both going to be huge contributors in 2024. I think I thought that regardless, but now thinking about their inclusion in the past game as well. Like, I don't know. I'm just, I'm really excited about the way both these guys can be used. Yeah. So Najee, his rookie season, um, he had 74 receptions on 94 74. targets. Yeah. 74 receptions, 94 targets, heavily involved in the passing game. And then that took a big dip because he dropped to 41 receptions on 53 targets in the second year and an even bigger dip going from to 29 targets or 20, 29 receptions on 38 targets just last season. So, yeah, it, it, from his rookie year to his third year, there was a significant <laughs> drop off in the past. Yeah, game. I mean, um, Jalen Warren, opposite, opposite for J- I would that, say but. opposite for Jalen Warren because Jalen Warren, his first year, he had 28 receptions on 33 targets. And then this last year he had 61 receptions for 74 targets. So obviously the Steelers were very aware of how, how they were going to be using him and used him on those like third down passing down situations. And what I'm curious about, and I just want, just wanted to look at what the stats are saying based off of the Falcons last year, um, because Arthur Smith was the head coach. So B. John Robinson was third on the team last year in receptions and targets. He had 58 receptions on 86 targets. And Tyler Algier, who was their running back two, was tied for fifth in receptions and was sixth in targets on the team. He had 18 receptions on 23 targets, which Tyler Algier, not very, not like always very much known as a receiving back in and of himself. But the fact that, he's mixed in to the top like six guys to, for your offense. And that's, this is including Kyle Pitts and Jonu Smith. So when, you, when you're looking at, if you even take out tight ends, you're talking about B. John Robinson being your number two receiver and Tyler Algier being like your fourth receiver on, on the Falcons last season, if you exclude those tight ends. So they have heavy involvement with their running backs in, in the passing games. And it's going to be very relevant. And I feel like we've seen, We've seen good things from Najee in the passing game, so I think it'd be cool to see him be involved in that more. And we've already seen really good things from Jalen Warren. And so at, at times, most of his yardage is coming off of these passes out of the backfields in, in some of the games in his career. So I'm excited to see what they can do with both of those guys on the field in those situations, or even if it's just one of those guys on the field, using them more in the passing game. I've always been a fan of if you have the ability to using the running backs out of out of the backfield as well that because of the weapon that they can be like I I, I look especially at Jalen Warren as a weapon out of the backfield because I feel like there's been several times in his career that he has these like hundred yards from scrimmage games and like eighty of them are receptions and only like twenty rushing yards I but I, I that's not to, to slight his like rushing impact but just saying how the Steelers have already used him, I feel like they could already they can add on to that even more, especially looking at the way they used a guy like Bijan Robinson last year. Falcons, I'm looking I mean, at the it. Steelers. <laughs> well, that'd be cool. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at it like being being able to utilize it as less of a tell for the defense if you can get them utilized in other ways. Like using Najee Harris more in the past game, and using Jalen more between the tackles because otherwise, like I feel like it's almost a good read for other teams, depending on who they see on the field. They know what's coming like, Oh, if Jalen's on the field, this is going to be a pass play. 
if Najee's on the field, they're not going to pass. So I feel like if we can get away from that and have the running back be a less of an indicator for what the play call is, that would also certainly be beneficial too, keeping the defense honest. I so, just wait until you have those two guys on the field, and then you bring out Justin yeah. Fields as well. Yeah, there you and go. And you have a whole Taysom Hill thing going on. Yeah. Somebody actually asked a question about Justin Fields, so I guess that's a, that's a good segue. We'll bring that up right now. This was actually sent to me via Instagram. Uh, my guy Robert Burke said, would you like to see JF1 be used similar to, similar to Slash? So we're going back to Slash for this one. Not not uh, Taysom Hill. We don't care about him. This is a Steelers show. We're talking about Slash. Okay. We're not Stewart. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'll say this. I don't envision a world where Justin is used as a receiver slash tight end at all. So that is why I wouldn't say either of those guys like a Taysom role or a slash role. But I do envision a world where there's packages for him to be used as a runner. And Russell Wilson kind of talked about as much today saying that, you know, to keep defenses honest, certainly, you know, there's a world where I would be open to, you know, utilizing him in that way, or the Steelers should utilize him that way. Um, And I agree. Like you go back to Arthur's time in Tennessee where he had Ryan Tannehill. They also had Marcus Mariota on the roster and they had some packages where Mariota would come in uh, quarterback design runs. But like, you gotta be able to throw out of those too. Getting back to what I just said about the running backs. You mm-hmm. don't want it to be a total tell for what the play call is. So you got to keep teams honest. But at this point in Russell's career too, I think even in like short yardage circumstances where you do a QB sneak, I'd rather have that be Justin than Russell. Uh, around the goal line, I could see it being Justin instead of Russell. Like my mind is open to all these possibilities that they are going to use Justin in some packages this year. Uh, again, I don't necessarily see it being uh, Cordell Stewart or Taysom Hill type role, but I do think that he's going to get on the field in 2024, like even with a healthy Russell Wilson in certain situations. Yeah. Okay. But, y- y- you know, to be fair, though, if you take out the receiving part of it, those mm-hmm. those two those two would be pretty similar to what Justin Fields will be doing, ideally. Like Taysom Hill, especially in the run game, around the goal line, it's an easy call to bring in Taysom Hill for the Saints. And in like fourth down or short yardage situations, they use him as well. I feel like that, like you take out the receiving part. We're not going to see Justin Fields running down the field in receptions. I, I fully right. agree with you there. But I feel mm-hmm. like the usage in those short yarded situations, in those rushing situations, I think that you could see Justin Fields be utilized, even if Russell Wilson is still the healthy starter. I, I think that it would be foolish for you to have talent sitting on the sideline if that was that that you could use him. Now, with that being said, I feel like probably the only like smart way to do it or the more logical way to do it is probably through like Wildcat because I just can't imagine how you would have Najee Harris and Jalen Warren sitting there and be like, why are we not using either of them in a running situation? That's where it's going to be more interesting to me is like the balance. Even if Justin Fields does get in, it's almost like if he does come in, well, you're probably going to be seeing fans question like, why is he even doing that? Because you have two running backs that are very effective. So maybe that will li- actually well, Justin's limit still the much- most explosive out of the three of them. Oh yeah, for sure. But yeah. I, I think that's probably part of the reason. Like the, I'm thinking of it that way because of the usage I'm thinking about is typically in those short yardage situations or the goal line situations. Like I feel like I would probably rather have a guy like Najee Harris in a goal line situation than I would Justin Fields. Unless you're literally getting under center and just doing a tush push, but that's completely yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah. Justin from like one yard away or Najee Harris from like four or five. It's a different conversation, I think. Yeah. Well, and that's where like explosiveness has nothing to do with it in that sense. It's just yeah. a QB sneak versus a, a running play. Yeah. But that's why I said like in QB sneak situations, it's also Justin Fields for me, just because of his stature compared to Russell Wilson's. Yeah. So um, I don't know. I think see how he's definitely going to be appealed. Yeah. I, I have, he's not going to be used on kick returns. That's for sure. No. I can't believe that that even like became a thing. Like I know Jalen was just, it was harmless. 
to bring up, but it was clearly a joke that Danny Smith was just messing around and Jalen brought it up on a podcast and everybody heard it and started running with it. But uh, yeah, it sparked a conversation that was uh, completely unnecessary regarding Justin Fields. Um, I think that was the only thing Justin Fields related that we had here. Let me see what else we got. Derek says, which second year player are you most excited about? And what are your expectations for them in 2024? I'll let you go first so we don't pick the same guy. Which second year player are we most excited about? And what are your expectations for them? Oh, I'm trying to think. Because, I mean, there's we talked about it last week a little bit, not necessarily the same exact answer or same exact question, but we did talk about those second-year guys. And it, it, there's a case to be made for several of them, of which I am most excited about and, and what my expectations are. Um, it's almost like, like I want to answer it differently than most excited about because most excited about is like – that's a fine answer, but me, to me, it's like I'm just the most intrigued about some some players more than I'm excited about them. Like I'm more intrigued about whether Roger Jones is going to look better or worse sliding over to the left side. I don't know if that necessarily means I'm more excited about him, but that's probably the player if I'm looking at it just strictly based off of uh, my intrigue towards their position. Because I mean, Joey Porter Jr. He's he he had this flash last season and I expect him to grow on that. Mm -hmm. The other one is like Keanu Benton, which I mentioned last week on our Steelers show that I'm also very intrigued about to see his progress in year two because of the lack of depth you have at the defensive tackle position, the future being unsure with Cam Hayward. We're not sure what is going to be going on with that. Is, is Keanu Benton going to have to be that defensive tackle of the future for the Steelers? So yeah, I mean, there's different players that I could look at and say I'm, I'm most excited about. Um, but I would rather answer it being the most intrigued. I'll go with Broderick, though, because I feel like it is going to be very curious to me how he responds to moving back to left tackle after playing majority right tackle in his rookie season in the NFL. I'm curious to see how that, that's going to shape up with the offensive line and just him in particular. He's going to be going against a lot of really good edge rushers. I want to see if he's able to adjust and have a great, uh, sophomore season like he did his rookie season and be able to grow on that because it's it, whether they want to admit it or not it's fa it's harder going to the left and it's harder going to a position that despite playing that your senior year or I guess technically junior year in college um, you, you didn't play almost all of last season and so I'm curious to see what it's going to be like for him and that's probably what I'm not necessarily the most excited about. I guess excite, excitement is just such a hard one to really describe with these players. I'm excited to see all of them, but I'm very intrigued about how Broderick Jones is going to respond to be moving to the left tackle full time. Yeah, I don't think you could do wrong saying any of their first three picks. Um, you know, Broderick, Joey, or Keanu. Um, I'm going to say Joey, though, just because not just to be different from your answer. Obviously, mm -hmm. Broderick is going to be very important for the 2024 team. But if something were to happen there, you feel at least okay about Dan Moore, right? If something happens yep. to Joey, what are they doing at corner? Like, I mean, Joey needs to take the year two leap that not only we expect, but he's also talked about himself. Um, I mean, listen to the, how conf like, you, and you got to love the confidence too. Like, I guess I should bring that up. Uh, what did you make of his statements basically saying that he feels like he's the best corner in the NFL? I mean, I love it. I, I, I got to love it as a, as a fan. I love that he has that mentality. Whether he's right or not, I mean, people can debate that. I don't care what the answer is um, from other people. But as long as Joey Porter Jr. thinks that, and that's the mentality that he's going to the season with, I love it. I don't mind those comments at all, especially at DB, at outside corner, a position where you're going against the Diva wide receivers. You have to have a little cockiness to you. And whether yeah. that turns people off or not, that's up to them, but I love those comments. I, I I would rather have a guy be the most confident player on the field than have someone be humble and shy away from it, at, at least at that position that he's playing. Right. I mean, what what are people expecting him to say? Like, oh, yeah, I'm probably somewhere in the top, like, 15 to I'm like, 20. I'm like, I'm like CB11. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this is absolutely the mindset that you well, want if you him to have. That out. Well, according to PFF, I am quarterback 12 <laughs> on the season. 
Uh, well, actually, what's funny is I'm pretty sure he's like top five in pretty much everything PFF rankings from last oh, really? year as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, absolutely, I think that he's to me just as important because of what's behind him at corner as you know the tackle spot. Like I said, you know, like you said, top three in terms of most important positions on the field, the quarterback's blind spot. Um, and such a young player going back to the left, it's basically another rookie season for Broderick. But with what's behind Joey. Uh, with the way that he's talked with, you know, obviously the wide receivers that we face every single year, like going head to head against Cincinnati, uh, Cleveland, obviously has Amari Cooper, the Ravens have Zay flowers and, you know, are continuously looking to improve their wide receivers. Um, yeah, I'm excited about year two, Joey, and I want to see him, the Steelers for a long time. And this just goes to show the faith that they had in Joey Porter jr. Very early. They, for a long time, just said, this is our left boundary corner. This is our right boundary corner. And they didn't travel with guys. Joey was traveling last year with number yeah. ones. So there's no reason to think that's not going to happen again in year two. I know that people were like a bit upset about the fact that like right out of the gate, he wasn't starting over Levi Wallace. But he's talked about he thought that that was important to let him develop in the way that they did. They were patient with him. They put him out there when they thought he was ready and looked at the return on investment they got in year one because of doing so. So I'm very excited for year two um, expectations. Uh, I think I'll, the one thing I will say is I think the interception production goes up a bit, but I, I don't expect to see like a drop off in terms of his coverage stats or anything like that. Hopefully he, the penalties go down a little bit and the interceptions go up. Oh, I forgot to say my expectations for Broderick too. Um, I don't even know what to say for that. What, like, my expectations is that he has, just as good as a rookie season on the left as he had had on the right. If he repeats what he did his rookie okay. season from a, a a full season scope outlook, now I, like there's a, there's games here and there you want to forget. Like I I think one in particular was like the L.A. Rams game. I thought was probably his worst game of the season last year. But if you look at just the season scope, as long as he has just as good of a season on the left side as he had on the right side, I will be. be not just please, I'll be even more impressed because of the difficulty he's going to be dealing with being on at that left tackle spot. Yeah. Per, I, I mean, trying to think back to last year, like he wasn't very good at, down the stretch most games, to be honest. I thought Arizona was really rough, but I think it will be a reverse of that. Like, I, I think that out of the gate this year, it's going to be interesting to see him mm -hmm. going back on the left and all the moving pieces. So like, I could see him struggling out the gate, but I think by the end of the year, and this is talking about the Steelers offensive line. So like, you can't even say that I'm just being a homer and super optimistic because I haven't been when it comes to this offensive line. I think by yeah. the end of the year, we're talking about a top dozen offensive line in the NFL. And I, I wonder for Broderick specifically too. And we had, a, I mean, don't get me wrong. We had a big conversation about James Daniels to open up the show, but I wonder if being on the other side with a, a guard pairing of Isaac Samalo next to you and that veteran leadership mm -hmm. to be able to like mentor you on that side as well. I wonder how that's going to impact him too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you can go wrong, whether it's Daniels or Sam Allo. I, I, Sam Allo has won a Super Bowl. So, you know, maybe there's there's some and he's 30 as opposed to 27. So, yeah, I mean, there's certainly a little bit more experience there. Um, maybe the type of player that he wants to be aligns more with him. Um, it's certainly possible, man. I'm excited about Fatanu as well as a first year player. I know the question was about second year players. Um, might as well lump Keanu Benton in with the second year guys, though, as well. I mean, talk about yeah. important players. He's, <laughs> I mean, long term, this defensive line right now it is Keanu Benton and nobody else. So, I'm I'm excited about all these guys, but I'll go with Joey for who I'm most excited about. Appreciate the question, uh, there, Derek. Who at the time of recording this might still be was certainly on 93.7 The Fan, uh, with our guy Donnie Football just a little bit ago. Oh, speaking of Keanu Benton, uh, my guy Chop Chop says are you ready for the keanu benton leap speaking of chop that is this person's username also the keanu benton chop his club move i'm excited to see them come back in year two uh, i just mentioned i legitimately think that he's the only like long-term piece right now on this defensive line um when you look at every everything else that like could potentially be like logan lee who they just drafted I, I don't th like if he ends up being a pleasant surprise and proves me wrong. Great. But like, who else do you look at right now? as like, this is potentially a guy going forward in the long term. I, I don't see it. I, I think it is Keanu Benton and guys that aren't here right now. 
So I think he's certainly a building block. He's a nice start, but they got a lot more work to do in terms of filling out this defensive line to get them ready for their future. Um, but yeah, I am very excited about Keanu Benton in year two. Like he's only going to get better. Love what I've seen in terms of the videos, the workouts, um, how those moves look early on here in OTAs. Like he plays the position that he plays very hard to take anything from OTAs in terms of mm -hmm. guys that play along either side of the trenches. Um, but just from like a physical standpoint, looks good, looks explosive, looks good running the drills. Going to be hard to say where he's at exactly until we see some training camp stuff. Um, but Certainly, certainly very excited about Keanu Benton. Yeah, I think despite what I just said about Broderick Jones, if I'm looking at, if I'm ranking the importance of those guys succeeding in year two, I would probably rank Joey Porter Jr. one, and then I'd probably say Keanu Benton two and mm. Broderick Jones three. And when I look at that as the scope of their second season, but also the future success of the Steelers, because while obviously you don't want Broderick Jones to fail, you do have Dan Moore Jr. if you need him in a pinch if if one of those tackles are going to be underperforming. With Keanu Benton, you just went through it. There's not a lot of future prospect for this defensive tackle group, and that's something that's going to have to grow next offseason and, and in the future of the Steelers because you have guys that are going to be aging out and retiring and all sorts of stuff. So mm -hmm. I think Keanu Benton's success could be – not necessarily more important just from the position itself. When you when you look at the depth of the team and how the team is set up for this upcoming season, I think that it could be more important than Broderick Jones, at least just because of the immediate impact and having Dan Moore Jr. being able to step into left tackle if Broderick does struggle. Yeah. I mean, along the defensive line, we're talking about, obviously, Cam, that situation, I assume we'll get figured out here in short order, uh, and he'll be back. Keanu. Larry Ogunjobi, who's disappointed, in my opinion, in terms of his mm -hmm. Steelers tenure. Um, Monty Adams, pretty decent player. Uh, they just brought in Dean Lowry. But then you're talking about, like, you know, DeMarvin Leal, Isaiah Loudermilk. One of those guys, by the end of training camp, could certainly be cut. Speaking of cut, Smitty from around the 412 here. And while I may not have much hair, the hair that I do have will not be cut by anybody besides Keith at Keith's Barbershop. My friend Christian Circle, been with us since day one. Keith's Barbershop, located 401 Burkitch Way, Suite 2 in Beaver, PA. Download the app The Cut, book an appointment with Christian today, or you can do walk-in with Tony or Ashley. But again, Keith's Barbershop, 401 Burkitch Way, Suite 2 in Beaver, PA. Go check them out. Old school vibe in there. Absolutely love it. Cannot recommend them enough. Wouldn't go anywhere else. Maybe I'll see you there. Uh, the download the app, the cut, put an appointment with Christian teach barbershop. Like I said, um, yeah, I just don't feel good about the status of the defensive line moving forward beyond 2024. Um, and if Broderick isn't good, I don't necessarily feel good about the tackles going beyond 2024 either, but for 2024, <laughs> yeah, I think true. you at least have Dan Moore. Um, but I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how that one plays out. Um, uh, Anyways, the, the original question was just, are you ready for the Keanu Benton leap? Yes, I am ready for the Keanu Benton leap. Uh, Zach, great name, asked, how soon after June 1st is Brandon Ayuk or Debo Samuel or DK Metcalf going to be here? So June 1st, big day for NFL contracts because any player that is traded after June 1st, the team that is taking on whatever salary remaining for the player um, can split it into two seasons. So, like, in the case of Seattle, if they trade DK Metcalf, post-June 1, they can split the salary that they are taking on as dead cap over 2024 and 2025 as opposed to eating it all within one season. So it makes it a little mm -hmm. bit beneficial to them from a financial standpoint. And there are a lot of guys that fall into that bucket that could be a post-June 1 trade. Um, in terms of the guys that are listed here, I do not necessarily see them as that realistic. Like, Debo Samuel is actually the most realistic one to me here. Um, and here's why they just re-signed Juwan Jennings, which I'm upset about because I thought he was, I mean, I thought about him last week. I thought he made uh, the most sense. I thought maybe we were talking about the wrong 49ers guy this entire time. I think they're going to pay Brandon Ayuk. And then I think they're going to look to move on from Debo Samuel. And I think that's the route they should go. I think Ayuk is the better player. He's the younger player. He's been the healthier player. Uh, he can operate more as a receiver than Debo Samuel. Debo Samuel does a lot of cool things once the ball gets in his hands. Not the most refined route runner. 
doesn't do the most, you know, in terms of his route tree uh, on the boundary. Like he does a lot of great things for you, but again, I think just there's more nuance to IU's game uh, in terms of a traditional receiver. So I think that should be the route that they go. Uh, so I don't view IU as very much likely. Uh, a receiver did get paid today in Jalen Waddle, and I don't know, maybe for better or worse, that changes things for an IU deal uh, with the 49ers or somebody else. But like based off that, I got to get like 30 million or right around that ballpark. Mm-hmm. To me, I think he's a better player than Jalen Waddle. I think he should definitely get a little bit more than he did. And if that's the case, Waddle's getting 28 points something per year. I should certainly be right within that 30. Uh, so I would say Debo Samuel's probably the most realistic, but I really don't see any of those guys to be honest. <laughs> yeah, not to burst the bubble even more. I don't see it either. I just, I just don't think it's realistic. The, it's, I, I, I talked about how, earlier in the show how different this regime is for the Steelers. So you know, who knows? Maybe I'm wrong, but mm-hmm. I don't think they're that different where they're they're going to make a move like that yet. Um, obviously, they made move that they would would not do in the past, and they do need wide wide receiver help. I just don't think it's going to come from either of those San Francisco guys. I, if if that ship was going to happen, I feel like that would have happened pre draft, not post draft. And since yeah. it didn't happen pre-draft, I, I I just don't think that that's realistic. And we talked about it last week. They're probably going to add somebody that's going to be like competing for a wide receiver three spot, not somebody that's going to come in and is, you're automatically going to know they're they're wide receiver one or two. So that I just don't think the Steelers are going to go for guys like that. So post June one, sorry, I don't think the Steelers are going to be involved. It, that is co- obviously coming up though. By the time people are watching, and listening to this, it is June one. So yeah, we will see. Uh, you know how that's going to play out. It's going to be interesting. I think it's certainly something worth monitoring now that it has hit June one to see if something comes to fruition. But like, maybe look at other guys that we're not talking about here. Um, like, does a Cortland Sutton trade become more viable? That's the one I was literally I was literally typing in his name as you were yeah. saying that. That that's the one that I'm holding on hope for. Because I've always liked Cortland Sutton. I think he's a really good player. And if he has a relationship with Russell Wilson that he could come in and be an asset for this team, I'm all for it. I think he has been an underrated player who has been played by bad quarterback play since he's come into the league. He had a good season in 2019, but then ever since then, I feel like injuries and bad quarterback play. Towards ACL in 20. Yeah, towards ACL in 20. So I feel like bad quarterback play and injuries are what has held him back from being the wide receiver I thought he could have been. Um, but I think that if he comes in, he's easily your wide receiver too. Um, as, as soon as he comes in, at least to, to me, and I feel like Roman Wilson would have to outplay him to, to unseat him as wide receiver too, but it makes me feel way better about your wide receiver depth. If you get a guy like that and that becomes more realistic after June one, I, I would be all over Cortland Sutton if I were the Steelers. Like firmly, firmly your wide receiver too. Like I think yeah. he's like Pickens is clearly your one over him, but I also think Cortland is clearly over Roman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why I said like Roman would have to work to unseat Cortland, not but necessarily like, question it preseason. But and I'm saying it's almost like good because people know where they stand. Like yeah, no, absolutely, some, like, competition. Absolutely. Yeah, because like I'm not gonna lie to you. I, I'm not saying that this should be on the Steelers' mind. But like George is probably loving this. The fact that he's like so uncontested for wide receiver one role right now on the Steelers. Yeah. So like, do you want to risk upsetting him by bringing in uh, a Brandon Ayuk, a Debo Samuel, a DK Metcalf that kind of challenges him for that role? Yeah, to me, I'll, true. I, yes, I do. Like, I don't view it that way. <laughs> like, if he's yeah. going to be upset yeah, about yeah. it, that's on him. Yeah. But I'm absolutely. just saying. Also, uh, Cortland Sutton did have ten rest- touchdowns last year, ten receiving yeah. touchdowns. So, yeah, I I think he's probably what he had. He probably had like seven hundred, eight hundred yards. He had seven hundred and seventy-two, eight hundred the year before yeah. that, eight hundred twenty-nine. But on on fifty-nine receptions, he had seven hundred seventy-two yards, ten touchdowns. I feel like it's an immediate upgrade at a position of need. That that is the one that I've been holding on uh, hope for, and mainly because. Mm-hmm. I, I, if this was a different quarterback room, I wouldn't even be giving this a second thought. But because he has had the past couple seasons that have had a connection with Russell Wilson and they have that relationship, that's why I'm really holding on hope for this one. That's the one that I if, – if I'm saying that's my guy 
that among the wide receivers that could be uh, traded to the Steelers, that is my guy. That's the one I am wishing will happen. Yeah, the contract stuff's going to be interesting because that's why he's not with the Broncos right now. Uh, so he's mm-hmm. looking for more than $2 million guaranteed on this. So, you know, are the Steelers going to be interested in giving him an extension, adding money for him in 2024 and beyond? Uh, we'll see. I agree that I'm certainly intrigued by the idea of adding Cortland Sutton. A name that I brought up last week was Darius Slayton. Uh, he returned to Giants OTAs, got some uh, incentives thrown into his contract. So I guess that, you know, sufficed him. Um, so that one doesn't look like it's going to be happening. I, I think, honestly, the team to watch right now is the Texans. Something's got to give with their receiving room. Um, they have too many guys. Like, they're not keeping eight receivers, seven, eight receivers like they have right now um, that are NFL caliber. So whether it's John Mechie, whether it's Robert Woods, somebody that ilk probably is not making that football team. Nick um, Collins. A, <laughs> also got paid since our last show, another receiver that got paid. Uh, great deal, in my opinion, uh, for both sides. I think, you know, he's not even no, 25 yet. Like if, you're, if you're going based off of trends of what the Steelers have done, uh, mm-hmm. this off season, Robert adding Woods? a bunch of wide, uh, body, no, I was gonna say adding a bunch oh. of wide receiver fives, they're gonna be uh, Ben Skoranek. <laughs> well, it, yeah, they just got him, but I'm not <laughs> saying, yeah, like he <laughs> certainly might not make that roster, but um, I don't know, like I feel like I, I think if they got Robert Woods, a lot of people probably view it like Allen Robinson, like you're yeah. getting a player that was good but clearly passed his prime, and is there even anything athletically left? I don't know. I haven't. I didn't watch a ton of him last year to say. I'm just mad that they re-signed Noah Brown. Noah Brown would have been a great stealer. And they didn't even have the use for him after they traded for like So that wide receiver room right now, right? Nico Collins, Stephon Diggs, Tank Dell, Noah Brown, Robert Woods, John Mechie, Ben Skoronek. Is there anybody else? That's seven right there. Um... Who all did you name? I'm trying to think of everybody you know. Xavier Diggs, Hutchinson. Collins, Diggs, Collins, Dell, Woods, Noah Brown, John Mechie, Ben Skronik, Xavier Hutchinson, Johnny Johnson the third, Steven Sims, Jared mm-hmm. Wayne, and uh Jaden Janky. Okay, so like, yeah. Some of those guys are obvious cuts. Forgot about yeah, Steven yeah. Sims, though, who they re-signed as well. Probably more for a special team's value, but he's got to make the team if that's the case. They might be keeping Steelers seven. Legend. There's no way they're keeping eight, though. So, like, still somebody there. But there's an NFL receiver that's getting cut from that room. Yeah. Well, I mean, if they got Robert, if the Steelers got Robert Woods, mm-hmm. a lot of people might look at it as Allen Robinson, but I think it's an upgrade to what Allen Robinson than was. Jefferson. What's that? I think he's better than Van Jefferson still. In yeah, I, I think he's an upgrade to what Allen Robinson was for you on the Steelers last year. And now, granted, I don't think that was necessarily all Allen Robinson's fault because of the quarterback play that the entire offense got. But at the same time, Allen Robinson wasn't doing himself any favors. He, he wasn't being that productive. I just think that injuries him. have just sapped him of his athleticism. Like, he's just not that guy. Yeah, anymore. like, I'm not trying to say that Robert Woods was, like, far and away better, but, like, Allen Robinson last year had 34 receptions, 280 yards, and no touchdowns. Robert Woods had 40 receptions, um, 426 yards, and a touchdown. So, like, not night and day better, but, like, it would be a slight upgrade. Mm -hmm. Well, you're also talking about a different role as well. Like, I wonder how he would fit in here as, you know, a number two option on the boundary. Like, that's probably a significant upgrade from the role that he'd have right now. If you're looking yeah. at his his role in Houston, so if he has a role in Houston, who knows how that's going to shake out? Um, did we have any other questions? There might have been one more. Uh, what are oh uh, we kind of touched on this because John asked <laughs> what are real estate expectations for Joey Porter Jr. this upcoming season? Well, thanks to Derek's question, I answered that already. In terms of what, I if guess you know why? What do you, okay, well, there's a lot of expectations for Tyler. No, I mean, I, I think he he obviously needs to be your clear cut cornerback one, and I think that he has to find some consistent play on the outside to, uh, of himself. I think that he has to establish himself as one of the better outside boundaries. I'm not going to say like the best outside boundary corner in the NFL, like that's a tall task, but I feel like he just needs to be game in and game out the most consistent player in that secondary, uh, at least on the outside. I'm not going to say he's going to be necessarily more consistent or better than Minka. 
two completely different players, two completely different positions, both great mm-hmm. players. Um, but I do think that he needs to establish himself game in and game out as the best corner on the Steelers, and which I don't think is necessarily that hard to do. But I think you have to get consistent play that goes along with that, not just being the best player in your team, but consistently game in and game out, having those high level performances at the cornerback position. Because I, I feel like if you if you go back to college watching Joe Porter Juniors, like there were some definitely clear grievances that he needed to work out in the NFL last year or, or le, le, work out in the NFL as rookie season. I, d- I think he, he did better than expected his rookie season. You need to continue to grow on that. Like don't, don't get handsy. Don't get too physical on the outside. Consistent or work better at being a ball Hawk than you were in college. I think there's definitely opportunities to grow as good as he is. There's a lot of ways that he could grow as a player. And I think that consistently game in and game out, he needs to show that. Yeah, I mean, I kind of already touched on what I expect and what I think of Joey Porter Jr. going into year two, but I'm very excited. Um, and then uh, last question here at Willie Parker, love the handle. Uh, how are you feeling about this offense if Warren finishes top five in running back reception yards, uh, receiving yards? With Russell Wilson's check down reputation, Warren's career as a receiver in mind, would you bet on this happening? That's interesting. Let me see. Uh, NFL stats for 2023. I just want to know what yardage threshold we're looking at. Like, what would you have to hit to be uh, like within the top five? Uh, uh, last year, Brees Hall was number one with 591. Number five. So he would have to get to be pushing the top like five to seven. He would have to get 450 plus yards through the air. Um, cause you had, you had Brees Hall at number one with 591 and then you had, uh, McCaffrey with 564 at number two, um, w- Rashad white from Tampa at mm-hmm. 549. And then you had B. John at 487 yards, ETN 476 yards, Camara 466 yards. You know, what's uh, interesting in there. Samaj P. Ryan, 455 yards. You know, what's interesting. You just mentioned Arthur Smith's last running back in the top five. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, number four, 47. I think he's going to be right in that mix. Like, I, I know that this is kind of like a cop out answer because I'm, I, by the way, I would never give betting advice on here when I bet on this happening. Uh, no, I wouldn't bet on it happening, but I think there's a very good chance that he's certainly in the top 10. Um, top, top seven, sure. Like, top five is when you're like, I'm right on the fence. I'm right on the fence with that. Like, I, I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, I certainly think it's possible. I think that he will be out of the two, the more featured guy within that role of the passing game. Um, man. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like right there. I think that that's a to great be in the number. top 10. He basically has to be pushing 400 receiving yards. Right. Because number yeah. 10 last year I think he's, that's, was, that's uh, games was Gibson, and he had 389 yards. Okay. And then it just jumped. It jumped up like Eckler had 436. What's crazy is Eckler had 436, and he was hurt <laughs> for a lot of the last year. I mean, 400 yards, 17 games. That's 23 yards receiving a game. Yeah, I. I mean, I think, I think it's. I think it's doable. Like, the question will be how much is Najee going to be used as well in the passing game? Yeah. Like, is he going to take away from? some of the yards that Jalen could be getting, and that's why he doesn't get into the top five or whatever. Sure. Yeah. Oh, we got one last question here as we were talking. Scott says, regarding center, theoretically, if Frazier's ceiling potential is very high as center, is it realistic to think that his rookie year, while still learning, could at least be on par or better than what we got from Colt last year? I mean, the snapping issues were the big thing, right? Like, I think that there were still some redeeming qualities about Mason Cole um outside of that but like the snapping issues were the big thing i just feel like frazier's just so pro ready man I, I have questions about what the ceiling is but i think he's ready to start right now like that's why like the conversation between him and jackson powers johnson and graham barton was so interesting because i thought frazier was the better nfl player right now than the other two now those two i think in time are going to be better like those guys have like all pro potential at the position where mm-hmm. like frazier m- maybe he's a guy that could certainly make a couple pro bowls or something like that, but I don't view him as having that type of ceiling. Um, I just think he's going to be so steady in the middle for a long time. 
Uh, is it realistic to think that his rookie year could at least be on par better than we got from Cole last year? Yes. Like, I think he's I going think to it's be very, very realistic. I, I'm not. I'm not even going to say it's realistic. I think that's an expectation. It's expectation. Is, yeah, is, I, is, I think he's going to be. He needs to be better. I think he's going to be a good player immediately for them. I just I question is he ever going to be a, a great player for them at the position? Yeah. Well, while Mason Cole may not have been as bad as a lot of people feel like he was last year, he was still pretty bad. And so I I, I don't think yeah, the like, bar like 2022 was fine. 2023 yeah. to me. It was much more about the snaps than anything else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I just don't think the bar is going to be that high for him to be better than Mason Cole in 2024. Mm-hmm. So I think that, yeah, for me, it's not it's not just a... a I think it's an expectation of mine that Zach Frazier is going to be better than the center play we got in 2023. Yeah, that's I, I like that question, though, because I feel like we haven't talked about that in terms from 2023 to 2024, getting better play at that spot. Like, I know that they're going to have a competition. I just fully expect that Zach Frazier is going to beat out Nate Herbig. I assume that you're in that same camp, uh, and mm-hmm. he ends up being the starting center from day one. And I do. I, I expect, you know, better play at the center position this year because of having Zach Frazier instead of Mason Cole. I just think he was, you know, he's pro-ready. He's ready to roll. Uh, I certainly had some questions about the fit in Arthur Smith's offense specifically because he's he's a good athlete. I think he's a good enough athlete. Uh, but he's not the type of athlete that, again, the other two at the top were. So that's why I thought maybe they'd lean that direction, but certainly played out uh, in a way that they could get what they feel like and I feel like is a very good tackle and also Zach Frazier later on as opposed to having to take the center on the first round. So excited about that. Appreciate the questions, Scott. Appreciate the questions from everybody. Keep those coming, of course, in the comments. Tyler, do you have anything else? No, no. Good show. Uh, Just... Be sure to uh, give us a like on the video. Go subscribe to us on YouTube. Continuing to push that again. It, it, blind, mind blowing numbers that ninety one percent of you, ninety one point like eight percent of you, were not subscribed to our last Steelers episode. Absolutely not. Yeah. And hey, if for whatever reason, if this is your first time watching because of last week, uh, always know you guys can send us questions. However, whether it's in the comments. Or follow us everywhere, as Tyler said at the beginning of the show, and I will reiterate. Also, it's going across the ticker the entire show. Uh, but be sure to follow us everywhere at around the 412. We are everywhere. We're on X. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We're on TikTok. Uh, no need to follow us on threads, but I believe that we do still have an active account. It's on the ticker. Uh, on there. Yeah, that is also on the ticker. Um, so be sure to do that. Let us know what other co- type of content you guys would like to see too. We're certainly down to, to put out some other stuff besides just the weekly shows. But if you hit that notification bell, uh, you will know whenever we do post new content. Also, if you check out the description of the show, you'll see our sponsors that we talked about game changers, keeks, everything, custom designs, which I will throw at the Smitty to talk about real quick. Need a custom t-shirt, hoodie, tumbler. Stop what you're doing. Don't go anywhere else. Check out the link in the description. Everything Custom Designs, our friend Haley Wagner, small business. She can do all that for you. She even does around the 412 merch, T-shirts, hoodies, long sleeve tees, a bunch of different stuff. I even got a Tumblr from her as well. So go check out the link in the description. It goes directly to her Facebook page. All of her stuff can be found there. Again, Everything Custom Designs, Haley Wagner. She does great work. Can't recommend her enough. Go check it out. So the description to Everything Custom Designs will be there. The I'm sorry, the link will be in the description for everything custom designs. The link to our stuff directly, the Around the 412 merch from Haley will also be in the description. You can find t-shirts there, black, gray, or white. You can find hoodies there, same thing, long sleeve tees. I mentioned this on the Pirate Show, but you know, maybe this time of year, maybe not the best time to be rolling out long sleeve tees and hoodies, but I don't know what part of the world you guys live in. So those are live. Go check them out. Get one for yourself. Uh, if you're listening somewhere else, if you're not on YouTube, be sure to leave us uh, a like there, subscribe, um, leave us a five-star review, all that good stuff, whatever you guys can do on Spotify and Apple, wherever. Be sure to do that as well over there. Uh, and do both. If you're listening, just come onto the YouTube side real quick and subscribe for us. If you're watching, just go on to like Spotify or Apple, whatever platform you use, and subscribe and leave us a five-star review. Best of both worlds. We appreciate all of it. Uh, for Tyler, for Smitty. This has been the Around the 412 Steelers show. We'll talk to you guys next week.